Welcome to the Exam Room Live, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. We appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. Coming up today, we are going to be talking all about cholesterol. You know, we all need it, but too much of it can turn out to be just an artery clogging disaster. And who wants that? Millions of us have high cholesterol, though, and it's so easy to happen. So today we're going to learn five easy ways that you can lower your cholesterol naturally. And giving us those tips is the one and only Dr. Vanita Rahman. Thank you so very much for being here today. Looking forward to getting those tips from you. Thank you. All right. And... Dr. Rahman, she's taking your questions as well. So if there's something on your mind about cholesterol that you would like to ask the doctor, go ahead and post that in the comments or the chat box. You can also tweet it to us using that hashtag exam room live. Also today, there are big, big, big happenings down in Washington where the FDA has approved a pilot program that would dramatically reduce the number of animals that are used in drug development. Our own Elizabeth Baker is here to tell us all about this extraordinary program and give us the details on that. Elizabeth, thank you so very much for being here today. Of course. Plus, we're working on some stories at the exam room news desk. When we get a check on health headlines, you're going to love this one if you're big on social media because it turns out the next person to slide into your DMs might just save your life. We'll give you details on that story in a little while. But let's start with cholesterol. Nearly 100 million Americans have it, and it's largely preventable. And it's not just an adult problem now either. It's 7% of children between the ages of 7 and 19 have it as well. And a lot of that probably has to do with that standard American diet. So how can we reduce this? How can we reverse this unhealthy trend? For that, we welcome Dr. Vanita Rahman to the exam room live. Dr. Rahman, thanks so very much for being here. This is super concerning. You hear that number, 100 million Americans. And true or false, this really is high cholesterol is largely a preventable problem. For the most part, that's true. We believe that for the majority of people, their cholesterol levels are determined by their diet and lifestyle. There are a small minority of people for whom they may have a genetic uh, mutation that's causing high levels of cholesterol that may not respond to diet and lifestyle. But the good news is for the majority, it can be controlled. All right, before we get into the tips, let's go ahead and do kind of a cholesterol reset, a cholesterol 101, as it were. First of all, what is cholesterol and do we actually need it? Yeah, so great question. So what is cholesterol? It's a fat-soluble um, molecule, if you will, that's found in our bodies and we absolutely need it. Our cells use it to build cell walls. Um, it's used to make various vehicles in our blood that carry things. So we need it, but here's the problem. Um, too much can cause um, significant issues. Uh, and predominantly the concern with high levels of cholesterol is cardiovascular disease which remains the leading cause of death in the United States and worldwide. And we know that high cholesterol levels are a big contributor to that. So it's really important to uh, manage our cholesterol levels. A lot of us know that the uh, you know, high blood pressure mark is anything over 120, over 80. I think a lot of us, though, may not know what the high level mark is for cholesterol. So what would be considered an elevated cholesterol number? Yeah, so uh, generally speaking, I like to use the data from the Framingham study, which has been going on for decades and decades. And what we know from that is uh, a total cholesterol of 150 or less is protective, that people who maintain their cholesterol levels below 150 are at much lower risk for cardiovascular disease. Now, the other number to keep in mind is... Um, it gets a little confusing, but when you get your cholesterol levels, you see generally many different numbers, but the ones we look at are total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, and triglycerides. And um, another thing you can look at, and a lot of labs are now giving it to us, is the ratio of total cholesterol to HDL cholesterol. And we want that to be under four. That is also protective. So try to aim for one of those at least. A total less than 150 or that ratio of total cholesterol to HDL cholesterol less than four. And what is the difference between HDL and LDL cholesterol? 
Yeah, so this is very confusing. Um, what HDL and LDL actually refer to are the vehicles that are carrying cholesterol in our blood. So LDL are these cars, if you will, imagine them, they're traveling in our blood, they're carrying cholesterol to the rest of our body, and HDL is the vehicle that's removing it and taking it back to the liver where it can then be removed. So an easy way to remember this is LDL is sort of the lousy cholesterol. We want to keep it as low as possible. So L for LDL, lousy, keep it low. All right. H now, no, I'm then, sorry, go, go ahead. Yeah, and then HDL is the opposite. It's helpful, H for helpful, and we want to keep that uh, high as possible. That's helpful. All right. Now, so you said anything total cholesterol under 150 is optimal. I pulled some numbers uh, from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey before the show, N. Haynes study here. Um, and for Americans, the, the mean dietary cholesterol intake is 293 milligrams every day. For, for men, it's almost 350. Women, it's less than that. But my goodness gracious, as a doctor, you hear that number knowing that the optimal intake is so much lower than that. That has to be kind of alarming to you. Yeah. So we really want, uh, you know, our cholesterol levels tend to run high in the U.S., uh, predominantly due to our diet and lifestyle. And and, and that's actually in a way good news because that's something we can control unlike our genes. So there, this is uh, relatively good news. We can change our diet, we can change our lifestyle and bring this under control. And, uh, and it looks like, uh, well, one, we've lost my camera, so let me just do the, the voice off screen here for a second. Um, according to this study, 96% of cholesterol actually came from meat, eggs, grain products, and milk. And when I looked at that initially, I was like, grain products, really? Well, it turns out that they were including a lot of processed foods and processed bread in there. And those could also have butter and eggs and things like that in there. So 96%, based off of what it was you were just saying, that seems pretty accurate, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's really important for everyone to know that cholesterol, while we need it, we don't need to consume it. Our body can make all the cholesterol it needs. And when we consume it, it only serves to elevate our cholesterol levels. And the, the reason this is important is that cholesterol is found in all animal-based foods, uh, whether it's fish or poultry or red meat or dairy products, they are all rich in cholesterol, whereas plants are naturally cholesterol-free. So if we are consuming animal foods, we're likely to have higher levels of cholesterol. All right. Well, now let's see what we can do about those higher levels of cholesterol. You've got five ways to lower your cholesterol naturally. What is the first tip that you have for us? You know, first is to really cut out those foods that have cholesterol in them. So, uh, you know, again, red meat uh, and dairy are leading contributors to high cholesterol levels. And people um, often turn to fish because they've heard fish may be healthier. But here's the problem. Fish is also very high in cholesterol, especially shellfish like lobster or crabs or shrimp. They can have very high levels of cholesterol and even chicken and eggs. So it's really important to cut those out. Start by eliminating foods that are elevating our levels. And what are the kinds of foods for tip number two then? What are the types of foods that we should be eating? So anything plant-based will be naturally cholesterol-free. And so really aim for high fiber plant foods. So this one is easy. You know, the four basic plant food groups, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. So legumes are things like beans and lentils, like black beans are packed with not only protein, but also fiber. And these fiber rich foods help eliminate cholesterol from the body. So really important to get that fiber in. All right. I want you to take your time talking about this third tip because tis the season where this next one may break a lot of hearts. You're talking <laughs> about something in particular. What is your third tip? So avoid tropical fats. Now, what do I mean by that? So within the plant-based family, some foods are healthy and some aren't so great for us. So fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains are great. But these tropical fats, now this is um, these are foods that are really high in fat, particularly saturated fat, which raises our cholesterol levels. So there are three basic uh, food groups here, 
Uh, and I'm so sorry to break this to our audience, but chocolate is one of them, especially solid chocolate will be really high in saturated fat. So if you crave chocolate, go for cocoa powder, less saturated fat. And then coconut is naturally very high in saturated fat, especially coconut oil. So I recommend if you're trying to lower your cholesterol, just avoid all coconut products. And coconut oil is not a health food despite a lot of popular uh, pro, you know, proclamations out there that it can lower this or lower that. There's no evidence. Um, and then the third is not used so much in the US, but palm oil, which is used um, in many tropical countries. So avoiding these three is key. While you may not be cooking with palm oil, it will sneak into processed foods. So some of those um, vegan meats or cheeses will either be made with palm oil or coconut oil, and that will bring a lot of saturated fat with it. Yeah, that's a good tip. It's just because it's vegan doesn't necessarily mean that it's healthy. I think mm -hmm. a lot of the plant-based butters might also use that. Um, and certainly the desserts as well do. All right. Tip number four, less on the food front and more about getting up off of the couch. Yeah. So exercise is so important. We know that regular aerobic exercise has a slew of benefits, including lowering our cholesterol level. So regular aerobic exercise, which is where we're rhythmically moving our arms and legs for a prolonged period of time, like 20 to 30, 40 minutes, such as walking, jogging, biking, swimming, hiking. These can all help improve our HDL, the helpful cholesterol, and lower our overall cholesterol. So really important to get out there and move, even though we're in this pandemic, um, maybe getting outside um, can be really helpful. Let's go ahead and bring it home with tip number five. What do you have for us? Yeah, and this is one we don't want to forget. Um, if you smoke, it's really important to quit smoking. Um, we know that tobacco has no um, health benefits, and it is fraught with um, health hazards. And one of them is it uh, will... Uh, worsen our cholesterol levels. So if you smoke, really important to stop smoking. And not only will you help improve your cholesterol levels, you will reduce your overall risk of cardiovascular disease. Interesting that tobacco would factor in there. I mean, you wouldn't naturally associate that with uh, the cholesterol, but that's that's a good connection there. So all five tips, we'll go ahead and uh, tweet those out for you as well a little bit later on from at Chuck Carroll WLC. Uh, let's go ahead right now, Dr. Rahman, while we have you here and open up the doctor's mailbag. We have a great question here from Debbie, uh, who is writing about statins, cholesterol medication. She writes that, what if you have been following a strict Esselstyn, quote unquote, plan for one and a half years, but got off of statins nine months. But now you start to see that cholesterol rebound. So what is happening there? What advice can you offer, Debbie? Yeah. So, uh, you know, Debbie, a couple of things come to mind. So let's go through the five things we just talked about. So you're following the strict Esselstein plan. So you're not consuming any animal foods. So we can mark that off. Um, and then making sure you're getting plenty of fiber rich foods. So I say three to five servings a day of fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains. And do try to keep them whole grains because they will have more fiber in them. And then um, really making sure you're not consuming those tropical fats, because as we discussed, those do sneak in, uh, especially in restaurant food or commercially prepared food. So look for the words coconut oil or palm oil. And in the nutrition label, look for the amount of saturated fat in food. Even things like avocado can have a fair amount of saturated fat. So if your cholesterol has rebounded, maybe cutting back the avocados could be helpful. And then uh, other things, regular exercise and then maintaining a healthy BMI is also important because at higher levels of BMI, our cholesterol levels can rise. All right. Uh, if we didn't get to your question today, have no fear. We will save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. And I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention that Dr. Rahman is available to see patients via the wonders of telemedicine at the <laughs> Barnard Medical Center. And so to schedule your appointment with Dr. Rahman, head over to barnardmedical.org or call 202-527-7500 for a full list of states where services are available. And you can inquire about insurance as well. Uh, Dr. Rahman, I assume you You've worked with a number of patients on lowering their cholesterol. Yeah, you know, this is such a common um, issue that we see in our patients. And many of us come to us specifically for this because they 
they know they can take a statin, but they would prefer to try to reverse it naturally with diet and lifestyle. And we work on that with them. Outstanding. Dr. Rahman, thank you so very much. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, Chuck. Thank you. Let's switch gears now and turn to uh, some extraordinary news out of the nation's capital here in Washington. The FDA recently announcing a pilot program that would reduce the number of animals being used in drug testing, potentially sparing tens of millions of lives every single year. So as we shift over to these new human relevant methods, we want to learn more about this pilot program. What is it and what the effect will be as we move forward? For that, we welcome our Pharmaceutical Policy Program Director here at the Physicians Committee, Attorney Elizabeth Baker. Thank you so very much for joining us. Hey, Chuck. Great to be here. Back, uh, back to chat with you. Before we get going on this program, I think that it's important that we begin by addressing how these animals are actually being used in the test. And can you talk to us a little bit about that? Um, sure. For every single new drug that comes to market, there is extensive animal testing that is um, done at the non-clinical phase. So, so that is done prior to clinical trials in humans, sometimes concurrently as well. Um, the animals, as you imagine, they live in laboratories. Most of their interactions that they'll have with humans are the people who are um, feeding them or experimenting on them. And then at the end of the experiment, generally they are, um, they are killed. And we see the, a ton of different animal uh, species are used in drug development. Um, most common, and, and I think every drug that I've ever um, looked into, you'll see monkeys, mice, rats, and dogs but you also see cats, rabbits, guinea pigs, pigs, hamsters, and other animals as well. So basically, you name it, uh, there's a good chance that it's it's being tested there. I'm curious, though, when I think, well, I hear a lot of those animals. I don't even think that there's a close association with us as humans. And I'm kind of wondering, well, how in the world would testing being done on them in any way translate to the effect that the drug would potentially have on us? Yeah, so isn't that isn't that the, quite the question? So uh, the use of animals in drug testing started a long time ago, and really at the time, that's the science that we had. Um, since then, science has evolved quite a bit, and now we have methods that are based on human biology um, and that are much better for predicting human outcomes. We now have the data. We know that the animal studies are not very good at predicting what happens in humans because it depends on the species you use. Um, and even the FDA, the National Institutes of Health, say that uh, the vast majority of drugs, uh, over 90% um, that do appear safe and effective in animals will fail when they move into human clinical trials. And that goes to underscore the importance of this program. So let's talk a little bit more about it. Can you walk us through the details? Yeah, I'd love to. So um, I find it so exciting. This is something that at PCRM we have been working for um, for a number of years. And it was just last Monday that FDA launched it. It's called iStand, or Innovative Science and Technology for New Drugs. And what it does is it provides a pathway for companies to work with the Food and Drug Administration to be able to gain broad acceptance of a non-animal method. And this is so important because prior to iStand, there really was not a pathway for non-animal and human biology-based approaches to be accepted in a way that all drug sponsors or all drug developers could use them. So you have the traditional animal studies that have been used for years. Um, drug sponsors could use those confidently and know that the agency will accept them. Um, but the, the, the methods that have been developed more recently that are non-animal, that um, are based on human biology, they are just accepted on a case-by-case -case basis. And so what this means is that a company that wants to use one of these approaches needs to go to the agency, make a pitch for using it, do all sorts of additional work to provide extensive evaluation studies um, every single time that they want to use that approach, so for every product. And as you can imagine, this adds a lot of time, a lot of work to an already length, really lengthy and costly process. 
And it also really dissuades companies from using these approaches because they can just go ahead and use the animal test confidently and know that the FDA will accept it without having to do all of that additional work and perhaps delay um, delay development. And so this iStand program is so important because it removes those extra hurdles that companies have to go through in order to use a non-animal method um, for these approaches that are qualified under the program. And not only does it uh, provide this qualification pathway, it also just provides a much needed uh, pathway for companies to be able to interact with the agency. So not every method is at the point of um, acceptance right now, but they certainly could benefit from FDA input. And so this program allows, um, allows that as well. Well, let's talk about some of those methods. We've discussed previously on the show something called organ on a chip, which I thought was just fascinating. I mean, essentially my takeaway from that was like, it literally is like a, a chip about the size of a USB device that can give researchers almost all the data that they need as far as safety and efficiency and, and human relevancy. But what are some of the other methods that may become under consideration with iStand? Sure. Well, um, so this is a broad, iStand is a broad program. It covers all the drug development tools that are not eligible under an, F an existing program at FDA. And so it really would provide a pathway for all these in vitro and computational approaches that utilize human biology. Um, I do wanna just jump into organ chips a little bit in case anyone um, viewing isn't familiar, but what they are is they are about the size of a USB. They're developed to mimic the structure and function of, um, of organs. And they can be used either on their own for testing, but they're also great because they can be linked with other organs into what are called microphysiological systems. Um, they are really exciting because they, you can use human cells that are easily obtained from a scrape of the skin. These cells are reprogrammed and they are grown into different organ cells um, that can be used in these different organ chips for testing new medicines. And so they're so exciting because they use human biology to help us understand human disease and predict human outcomes. Um, but I also think it's really exciting that they that organ chips specifically have been um, have been described uh, by FDA as one of the methods that may utilize this program because the FDA and our National Institutes of Health have done a lot of work already on these organ chips. So at National Institutes of Health, there is a center called the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. They are managing many programs with so many companies um, who are who have developed these programs and now they're working on um, evaluation. But also the FDA has brought several of these organ chips in-house for evaluation. Um, and I've worked closely with some really great FDA staff on a think tank for microphysiological systems or organ chips um, where we really are working to identify what needs to happen in order for these to be accepted. Um, and I think, um, so I, that part is really exciting, but it also um, lists non-clinical toxicology assays, and those are the in vitro computational approaches that, um, that our, our um, supporters hear about so often from us. It's so cool that something, you know, this size can contain so much data and do so much good in the world. Like that is just extraordinarily amazing to me. Mind blowing even. I mean, that is technology at its finest right there. Uh, really quickly as we kind of wrap this up, I mean, just super exciting details with this program here. Um, I want to learn more about the Physicians Committee's involvement in this. You mentioned it briefly um, a little bit earlier in the interview, but this is something you've been working on since 20. 2016, right? Yeah, that's correct. So I came to Physicians Committee in 2016, and I was tasked with integrating human biology-based and non-animal approaches into drug development. Um, in order to do that, I worked very closely with my boss, Christy Sullivan, um, and then others came on board after that. Uh, but very early on in 2017, we decided to bring together 
uh, stakeholders. So we had FDA, National Institutes of Health, pharmaceutical companies, technology developers, um, all to come together so we could identify what needed to happen in order to overcome barriers to using non-animal methods. And one of these, this path, this lack of a pathway is something that came up very early and uh, was very clear to us that needed to happen in order for us to really move things forward for these approaches that don't use animals. So we worked on a manuscript, um, just kind of outlining our, rec our recommendations for how we would move the field away from um, relying so heavily on animal studies and toward greater use of non-animal human biology-based approaches. We kept having these meetings and it eventually formed into a coalition of drug development stakeholders called the Non-Clinical Innovation and Patient Safety Initiative. Um, PCRM really leads all of the activities, but we do work with other stakeholders on different projects. So not everybody works on the same things. Um, we just do it, they, we just engage with other groups where it makes sense with the goals of their organization. But um, we really have focused on policy changes. As you said, I'm an attorney. So my big interest is how can we ensure that the policies um, that the policies support using the most predictive science that doesn't use animals. And so that's what we've been focusing on. We've been looking at the regulations, at guidance, and we have other projects going on there to change, um, to change the, these rules that govern and guide drug development. But this pathway has been a central part of our work for the past several years. Um, and you asked how we work on it. There's a, there's a few different things that we had going on kind of all at the same time. First is working with the Food and Drug Administration directly. So we provided input to the FDA at every chance that we got in order to let them know that the stakeholder community is saying this is needed um, and to provide all the justification. So FDA hosts a lot of stakeholder meetings and any meeting that they hosted that would have relevance to this program or uh, we, we were there <laughs> presenting on it. And so that there was um, drug development tools qualification program that the FDA has. Initially, we wanted that to just be expanded to cover these in vitro and computational approaches. Um, the FDA has a predictive toxicology roadmap that was launched several years ago, and we thought this should be a part of implementation. Also, the Office of New Drugs at the FDA was being reorganized, and um, so we put this forth as a policy initiative that they could undertake. Um, we worked with different committees that influence the FDA and in, in which the FDA participates. We met with, we really worked on growing industry partners who would use these technologies to be able to come with us to the FDA and say, uh, and, and provide justification from a different perspective for why the program is needed. So that's kind of like all the FDA work that we were, that we were doing. But at the same time, we were meeting with Congress. Congress is really important because Congress can put pressure on the agency, can help set the agency's agenda, provides funding to the agency. And so congressional um, action is taken very seriously by the agencies. So we started with hosting a briefing on Capitol Hill to um, educate offices and get, get people interested in, this, um, in the idea of this program. Then we supported members of Congress in sending a congressional inquiry to the FDA commissioner asking them to establish the program. And then we also supported the Senate and the House of Representatives in, um, in appropriations funding language. So all of that was happening at Congress. And then we, it was, we were obviously making progress. Um, like I said, I was part of this think tank, or I am part of this think tank on microphysiological systems and organ chips. And we were working on a manuscript um, highlighting really what needs to happen to get these methods to be used in drug development. And I, I did bring to the group that we need this kind of pathway to evaluate them. Um, and the group agreed and we put that into a manuscript. And then also FDA put together their own manuscript on their perspectives on toxicology, 
where they acknowledge the need for this program as well. And so all of that was really exciting. And I was just so happy to see uh, last Monday that this program was indeed launched. And really quickly, we're about out of time here. So in 30 seconds or less, can you tell us what's next? When do we go beyond this pilot program? What's the time frame there that we can hopefully graduate this thing into a full-blown, well-funded, permanent program? Well, it's hard to say because it's, you know, it's just launched. But what we are doing now is helping companies with submissions. We're having discussions with the FDA to see how we can support the agency because, of course, we do want to move it beyond this pilot phase. Uh, right now, it's likely to be limited to a handful of, of methods that are accepted through it. So we want to do everything we can to make sure the pilot is successful, that it is well-funded, um, so that it, it does become its own um, permanent standalone program at the FDA. All right. And I think a lot of people watching right now may also be thinking reducing is great, but I would really like to eliminate. So that I think is going to be the goal for a lot of people moving forward. And Elizabeth, I know that that is certainly something that we would love to see at the Physicians Committee as well. And the only way that we can make that happen is with support from our members and donors and people who want to push this pilot program forward as well. So I would encourage everybody watching right now, if you support this message, if you support ending or reducing animal testing, with drug development. Go ahead, please. If you can give what you can to the Physicians Committee, we would greatly appreciate that. I do believe we are matching dollar for dollar now, thanks to one of our generous donors, matching dollar for dollar through the end of the year. And you can get in on that right now by heading over to pcrm.org slash donate. Elizabeth Baker, thank you so very much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you, Chuck. Let's go ahead and take a trip now to the exam room news desk and get a check on health headlines today. We begin with heart disease. We spoke about that with Dr. Rahman earlier today. Well, there is new data out now that shows that heart disease accounts for one out of every three deaths worldwide. That was the statistic from last year. China had the most cases, followed by India and Russia, while the U.S. came in fourth. Most alarmingly, Cases of heart disease have doubled globally since 1990, but experts do say this is also one of the most preventable chronic illnesses out there, and a plant-based diet has been shown to reduce the risk or even in many cases reverse heart disease. All right, final story of the day, and this is a doozy. Uh, tease this one at the top of the show. Man, do I love it. Uh, the next person to slide into your DMs might just save your life. That is the findings of a new study where researchers sent direct messages to people twice a day for two weeks on Facebook, encouraging them to eat healthier. And what they found was specific to red meat, the people who were receiving these DMs actually cut their red meat consumption by almost half. And then naturally, what researchers at Cardiff weren't expecting was that people then also naturally began to become more interested in their health and actually reduce the amount of dairy they were consuming as well. So they slid into the DMs and their health changed forever. Pretty interesting stuff, right? <laughs> All right, coming up on the show tomorrow, we will be joined once again by Dr. Neil Barnard and dietitian Lee Crosby, the Fiber Queen. They will be teaming up to do a doctor's and dietitian's mailbag all episode long. So go ahead and load us up right now with your questions. Send them on over to at Chuck Carroll, WLC, or at PCRM. Just make sure when you send them, you use that hashtag exam room live. You can also post them right now in the comments section. And that's all the time that we have for today. I want to say thank you one more time to Dr. Vanita Rahman for joining us, as well as Elizabeth Baker. And to the crew behind the scenes that makes the magic happen, thank you guys as always. And to you, my exam roomies, appreciate you raising your health and nutrition IQ right alongside of us. For everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so very much for watching. Until tomorrow, stay safe, take a stand, and keep it plant-based.